I ja ću vam predstaviti našeg prvog gosta. U pitanju je viši saradnik na Jamestown fondaciji u Vašingtonu, neko ko ima izvrsne političke analize, neko ko je izuzetno angažovan intelektualac, neko ko je napisao veliki broj knjiga. Jedna od tih knjiga, poslednja koja je izašla, iako ne poslednja koja je napisana, ja sam to prevela, tako da u mom prevodu to je neuspješna država vodič za slom Rusije, s obzirom da smo na Filoškom fakultetu, izvinjavam se ako sam nešto pogriješila. I u tom smislu ću i postaviti pitanje našem prvom gostu, gospodinu Bugajskom, i preći ću na engleski jezik, ukoliko se slažete, i nadam se da to neće biti problem. So, hello. Hello. It's really great to see you here in Cetinje, and it's good that you are here. I just said a few words about your really amazing career. Just, I had a few sentences only, so you can add something if I forgot something, which is really important. But the end of my presentation of you was about your last book, the last published book, to be very precise. And this book was called Field Stay, The Guides to Russia's Rupture. So, can you tell us more about actually what is the impact of Russia's rupture on the region, on the Western Balkans? I will. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me to this important, uh, important forum. I've only been in Cetinia once before, and that was just before the collapse of Yugoslavia uh, in 1991, I think it was. Uh, no, 1990. Uh, th although I've been to Montenegro many, many times. Um, so, all these years later, I'm here to talk about on the eve of the collapse of Russia. Uh, so, again, uh, I'm, what I'm going to do actually, because I've got a lot to say, but what I'm going to do is outline uh, basically ten points why the world needs Russia's dissolution. And as you mentioned, that's the title of my new book, Failed State, A Guide to Russia's Rupture. Uh, the book has been translated into Ukrainian. I did a tour of Ukraine earlier this year promoting the book. It's been translated into Russian. It's now been distributed in Russia. Uh, and Polish and Finnish editions are in the process, as well as Bulgarian and Montenegrin edition, which uh, I'd like to, be, uh, to thank the Penn Center for, for publishing the book, translating and publishing the book in the coming months. So the first part of my book I'm not going to talk about very much. It's about Russia's internal decay. And I wrote that book, uh, actually, or that part of the book, before the war, the full-scale war against Ukraine began in February uh, last year. Um, but what I'd like to talk about is the impact of Russia's collapse, Russia's decay and rupture on neighboring states, because I think it's going to be beneficial. There's a lot of fear in the West about Russia's collapse. It reminds me of the fear of the dissolution of the Soviet bloc and the Soviet Union. Uh, in 1990-91, and look how beneficial in the end it was. So let me outline 10 points. Point one, Russia's dissolution will help guarantee European security. A ruptured Russia diminishes Moscow's military capabilities to engage in foreign aggression, invasion, and territorial conquests, both in Europe but also in Asia. A rump Muscovite state under intense international sanctions with failing, falling energy revenues, a depleted budget, and shorn of its resource base in Siberia, will have severely reduced capabilities to attack its neighbors or to foment unrest outside its borders. Hence, NATO's eastern flank, from the Arctic Sea to the Black Sea, will become more secure and enhance economic development and regional cooperation. Point one. Point two. Russia's dissolution will end Europe's energy dependence. As Russia dissolves, Moscow will lose control of energy product producing regions in Siberia and the Urals, and will no longer be able to blackmail European and Asian countries. International sanctions against Russia, including caps on energy imports that we now have, have proved positive for Europe, which has weaned itself off Russian imports, barring a few exceptions such as Hungary, Serbia, and Slovakia, and boosted alternative supplies and sources. The Western countries can rebuild energy relations with the newly emerging states in Siberia and the Urals that control their own resources and they can grow more prosperous without Moscow's exploitation and will not use energy as a political weapon against the West. Point three, Russia's dissolution will undercut political corruption. A fractured Russia will have fewer resources and influence 
to promote political corruption, interference in elections, influence and, and, and assist radical populist and anti-Western politicians, uh, or to weaken democracies in all regions of the world, as is particularly evident in the Balkans. This will help strengthen Western political and economic institutions, undercut bribery, blackmail and influence peddling by Moscow and its agents. The demise of Russia's economic oligarchy will also assist in making international financial institutions more transparent and less corrupt, as, much, as so much Russian dirty money has been laundered through them over the last two decades. Point four, Russia's dissolution will help combat global disinformation. When Russia disintegrates, Moscow will be unable to undermine democracies and promote or widen domestic conflicts through its anti-Western information wars. The myth of Russia's great power status will also be dispelled, through which the Kremlin spreads its influence throughout the world. This will also undercut its impact in Europe, and with the failures of the Russian colonial state, this will be fully on display in Africa, Asia, and Latin America, where Russia claims to have so much influence. For instance, the pro-Russian positions of the Serbian media media will become irrelevant when Russia is exposed as a failed state that cannot compete on the world stage and is collapsing through its internal contradictions, as the Marxists would say. Russia's Orthodox Church will lose its influence and its support for, the, for its Serbian counterpart. The Muscovite Patriarchate, after all, is an imperialist construct providing ideological justifications for colonialism and genocide as we are witnessing in Ukraine. Point five, Russia's dissolution will enhance multi-regional cooperation and economic development. In the wake of Russia's rupture, all bordering regions will be able to develop trade, transport, energy, and infrastructure connections without fear of disruption. When Russia ruptures, a number of new states can enhance their economic development and diversify their business investment. In the Western Balkans, without Russian support, Serbia's ability to destabilize the region will be reduced. And the threat of ethnic division, partition, or armed conflict in Bosnia-Herzegovina, Kosovo, and Montenegro will recede. At the same time, the EU project can gather momentum, and NATO will no longer have an internal flank or internal front that it will need to protect from Moscow's ambitions. However, I just add this caveat, Washington and Brussels must also beware of lighting fuses for future conflicts through any compromises with Belgrade's mini-imperialism. The creation of a Serbian entity in Kosovo, as envisaged by US and EU negotiators, will embolden the separatist, separatist government in Banja Luka and can also lead to calls for dividing or dominating Montenegro by Serbia. Hence, the performance of Montenegro's new government must be closely monitored to see how susceptible it is to Moscow's agenda. Once Russia ruptures, some post-Russia operatives may still try to destabilize countries such as Montenegro, but their capabilities will be substantially reduced. Point six, Russia's dissolution will ensure independence and territorial integrity for all of its neighbors. When Russia disintegrates, Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova can regain their occupied territories and petition for EU and NATO integration without fear of Moscow's reaction. Belarus can also secure its independence and European future. Central Asian states will become increasingly liberated and can deepen their energy, economic, and security connections with Europe, the United States, and NATO. Georgia will be able to negotiate the return of Abkhazia and South Ossetia within a Georgian federation. Armenia and Azerbaijan will be able to sign a peace treaty without Moscow's interference. This will also undercut negative Iranian influence in the region and help Turkey to develop relations with Turkic-speaking states in Central Asia and Turkic nations in the Russian Federation. And Georgia and Azerbaijan will be able to forge relations with the emerging independent republics of the North Caucasus and help them to become new partners with Western institutions. Point seven, Russia's dissolution will liberate a number of indigenous nations. 
After Russia's collapse, indigenous nations and distinct regions oppressed by Moscow will gain self-determination, sovereignty, land and resources. Several nations will also reclaim and rediscover their cultures, languages and identities that have been suppressed by Moscow for many generations. This includes the indigenous people of the Arctic, Siberia and the Far East. Several Western observers in Russia's ineffectual liberal opposition claim that these nations are too small to have their own state. And I've had these arguments quite frequently with some of the Russian opposition. Where have we heard this before? Montenegro's re-emergence in statehood fully, fully disproves that er erroneous theory. Moreover, some of the emerging states will be bigger than most European countries and will benefit from significant natural resources and strategic location to develop their economies. Point, point eight, Russia's dissolution will provide an impetus for building new democracies. Russia's rupture will release several new states in Europe and Asia that can move towards democracy and restore human and civil rights. We often hear that the collapse of Russia will result in the emergence of new authoritarian entities. I would phrase it differently. With Russia, democracy is always under threat. Without Russia, democracy becomes a much stronger proposition, which the Western and Eastern democracies can assist in their development. What remains of the Russian state, or a confederation of Russian regions, can finally develop into a non-imperial nation state with an opportunity for democratic development and economic progress. Russia will finally be liberated from its own imperial tradition that has retarded the country's progress. Hence, Russia's rupture will benefit Russia as well. Point nine, Russia's dissolution will empower new Western allies. When Russia ruptures, several new states in Europe and Asia will be able to choose their transatlantic and transpacific alliances while ensuring their security and economic development. This will also expand the common Western and Eastern Front against Chinese imperialism and help reinforce the development of transpacificism between North America, East Asia, Southeast Asia and Oceania. And lastly, point 10, <coughs> Russia's dissolution will help curtail negative Chinese influence. Although in a weaker position to expand its influence by collaborating with a failed Russia, China, paradoxically, will seek to benefit from Russia's rupture by expanding its presence among new states in Siberia and the Far East. The US and the EU must therefore deepen their presence in these regions and work with Japan, Canada, South Korea, and other Pacific states to open up avenues for diplomatic, political, and economic cooperation with embryonic allies. Regions and republics in Russia's Far East will seek recognition and investment from abroad. And similarly to the Central Asian states, they will resist incorporation into an expanding Chinese economic empire. Basically, America and Europe will have more allies and can focus on curtailing and combating Chinese imperialism without Russian obstruction and distraction. That's it, all of these factors demonstrate that Russia's imperial rupture will benefit global security, it will strengthen the independence of numerous states, and it will enhance global economic development. My case rests, thank you. <laughs> Uh, when, when I was preparing for the panel, I, I actually didn't know that we were starting with optimistic uh, worldviews. I'm so. an optimist. Okay, okay. So this, this, this was a, a surprise. If I understood it correctly, this was a future tense, not conditional? Like it, it's, it's both. Okay, it's both. It's, it's happening now, but it's going to accelerate. Okay, okay. So can I, can I maybe uh, ask a sure. question? Um, so what happens in the meanwhile? So basically... You, you were describing what happens when something happens on the eastern side of the world, but what, what is happening on the western side of the world and how does that influence us? So basically we were very optimistic about Biden's administration and this optimism didn't pin up mm -hmm. completely. And now we are also waiting for the next year's election in the United States and this is also not that optimistic. 
So what should we do in the meanwhile and what, sh what should we expect? When you say the Western side, you mean Western Balkans or you mean Europe? No, I mean even further, I mean US. Uh, all the way to the US? Yeah, right? yeah. Well, you know, it's a complex picture, but I would say yes, we were all disappointed in the Biden administration, which we thought would, let's say, break or, or cut the Gordian knot here and finally deal with Serbian mini-imperialism and enable Montenegro, Kosovo and uh, Bosnia to move towards European institutions, to, to consolidate their independence and democracies and so forth. Uh, I would say, you know, you can't give up. Um, my thesis is that as Russia weakens, as Russia collapses, you have more opportunities to strengthen your independence. All countries where Russia currently has influence, you'll be able to have, um, you'll be able to counter those negative, uh, um, negative policies of Russia uh, more effectively. I wouldn't necessarily wait for the next administration. You know, you, you're your own actors here. You can't wait whether it's Trump or Biden or, or somebody else. I'm going to vote for Al Capone. No, I'm joking. But, uh, it, you know, you've got to, it, it's, it, it's, it's your work to do. You have to, you've engaged in this struggle to build a state. Now you're engaged in the struggle to make sure that state survives, that your identity is recognized, that you join all the European institutions, particularly European Union. Um, and, uh, you know, you have neighbors who think the same way. You know, Kosovo, Croatia, uh, Bosnia Herzegovina, it's half of Bosnia Herzegovina. So, you know, my thesis is basically optimistic, but it doesn't mean there won't be a struggle and there won't be ups and downs during the course of that process. And just a quick one. Uh, so, what are our chances since you are in a predicting mode? Our chances? Yes. I'm optimistic. Of okay. course, you stay. You <laughs> Montenegro is going to be an independent state, it's going to join the European Union. What shape the European Union is going to be, I don't know. Um, it won't be a closed federation as some in Germany and, and France have, have wished, uh, but it's very important to have the European Union because it's the best hope for maintaining peace, stability and prosperity in the continent. Thank you. Thank you very much.